nobody ever read the tiger who came to tea. The children said, the little girl has a tiger that comes up for tea, eats everything, drinks everything, she can't even have a bath with no water left. I'm not actually here to talk to you about that book, but it's written by Judith Kerr. And Judith Kerr is also the author of When Hitler Stopped King Rabbit. And it tells the story of her experience as a child of refugees. She and her family were uprooted because she was Jewish. In fact, her parents made it like an adventure. So her, rem- her memories of it aren't all negative. And when hit the soul pink rabbit, I guess the message is in the title, she left one of her toys, her pink rabbit, at home. But the story brought to me what it meant for a child having to leave her school, her neighbours, her friends. And it was the first book, probably, that I read about the Holocaust. And in fact, I probably was the same age as the little boy in the middle of the picture in my nephew and me. When I was about 11, I used to meet a friend at a certain point on the road to walk to the station to go to school. And every day, we'd be near a house where a beautiful lady used to come and open her door, take the pint of milk, and go in, and sometimes would say hello. And I asked my mum who she was to be a neighbour. My mum told me her name was Dina. Dina Turgle was, in fact, a Holocaust survivor. She had been in a number of camps. She also had a number of siblings, many of whom were murdered. And she ended up at bergen belsen concentration camp in Germany, where she was eventually liberated by British troops. And in fact, went on to marry one of the liberators, and her wedding dress was made out of one of the power seats. An incredible story. But why I'm saying this is because I was brought up learning about and getting an interest in this subject. And I learned from an early age, or began to understand, where hatred can lead. Hatred leads to prejudice, leads to hatred, hatred to victimization and persecution, and persecution to genocide. And once I learned that, I think I also was asking the question that is inevitable, which is how could it have happened? Why would people do this to other people? And it might be easy for us to just say, you know what, these were evil monsters. They weren't like you and me. But they were human beings who committed monstrous acts. Human beings like you and me. What was the Holocaust? The Holocaust was a systematic, industrialized mass murder of six million Jewish people. It shook the foundations of society. The Nazis, the Hitler and the Nazis, tried to destroy a whole culture, families, communities, the repercussions of which are still felt today. And when we say six million, and with the shoes, that could be some idea, shoes of six million or thousands, millions of people, it makes you think, how can we really understand six million? We all wear shoes and we've all got different shoes. One plus one plus one. Every single person has a different taste in their food. But the point is these were individual people. Individual people with their own hopes and aspirations, like you, their lives cut short. And the individuals concerned are not only those the, one, the ones that were murdered, but I think it's important to know the individuals that survived. And in my work, I'm privileged to know and work with so many incredible survivors, mainly in Britain, but beyond the world. And what I find inspirational about them is that, despite what they've been through, they have something about them that is a zest for life, a love of life. And when they tell their testimony, they go around schools around the country delivering their testimony because they want people to know what happened to them, but also what happened to their families, with all the people who don't have a voice. They still do this with some sort of positivity. For instance, there's a survivor called Ziggy Shipper. Ziggy ends his testimony with the message, Do not hate. Another survivor, Ben Halscott, then, he was 15 at the end of the war. He weighed on the six stone. He ended up going to represent Great Britain as a weightlifting champion. 
I mean, if that isn't a triumph over adversity, I don't know what is. The thing is, though, when I tell you these positive stories, and it's it a source of inspiration to me, the truth is, the Holocaust is a dark episode. It's not a positive thing to talk about. Yet it's interesting to me that some survivors talk about small gestures that made a difference for them. I'll never forget a story from Anka Bergman. Anka was heavily pregnant. He was exhausted and starved and in incredible pain. And she was being transported on a cart from Dresden to Mackhausen concentration camp. And a local farmer saw her and gave her a glass of milk. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but I can tell you that most stories I hear are when the Jews are being transported, the locals laugh and jeer or walk away. So, this local farmer gravely gave her a glass of milk, and Anka maintained that this saved her life and that of her baby Eva that she gave birth to when she was liberated. Or Joan. Joan Stolper and her family were in occupied Paris and every day had to report to the local police station. And one day, a local policeman picked up her mother that she and her children, the two sisters, they were on the list. They were going to be deported. That small act of mercy gave the the family the opportunity to escape in a laundry van and they got out. They might seem like small things, but they made a difference. So they lived to tell that tale. And as well as these small gestures that I'm referring to, there were some bigger acts of kindness. People who, against all odds, took immense risks to help save lives. I can't tell you all the stories, but I do want to tell you about one. Actually Firstly, Nicholas Winton. Nicholas Winton was a 29 year old stockbroker in London and he understood that there was an imminent threat to Jews in Europe. It was just after Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht, when the Nazis burned down synagogues, vandalized Jewish shops, killed a number of Jews, forced Jews to walk on started glass barefoot in the street. Rabbis had their beards shaved off on them kneeling to down in front of synagogues while crowds jeered, known very much as a turning point in the Holocaust. He heard about it, and he was concerned what that meant for Jews in Europe. He was supposed to be going skiing in Switzerland, and he got a note from his friend, Martin Blake. It told him that he had an assignment for him and not to bring his skis. So Nicholas Winton went to Czechoslovakia. And when he was in Czechoslovakia, he saw for himself what he considered problematic times for Jews. He was worried for their welfare. He saw the squalor that Jewish children were living in and deteriorating conditions, and he wanted to help them get out. He was a 29 year old stockbroker. He sat in his hotel bedroom compiling extensive lists of names. He organized the gallant tours in England to take these children in, form after form raising money to enable these children to get out. The first transport that he organized was in March 1939. He organized seven more and managed to save 669 children. It's remarkable. There was, however, another train. The train set off, but two days later, war broke out. Of the 250 children on that train, two survived. Nicholas Winton held on supporting the war effort and joined the RAF, and afterwards he settled down in Maidenhead and had a family. And nearly 50 years later, his wife was clearing out the asset and discovered a suitcase full of names. And it was only then that the extent of what he had done really came to life. And this case, it was brought to the attention of some journalists. And there's this incredible moment that I encourage you all to look up uh, a program called That's Life, where the host, Esther Ransom, sees Nicholas Winton in the audience and says, Ask him what he did in the war. And it's just, you know, that you saved some children. And she says, You know, is anybody else in the audience here? But they saved by this man. And she sees people stand up around her, all saved 
by this man. It's the most humbling thing to watch. I'm very, very nervous. He didn't just stay down. They managed to have children, and their children had children. The generations as a result of his actions. You know, what was incredible is that he said that he did what anybody else would do. He had a motto that was, if something isn't impossible, there must be a way to do it. He was Mr. Nicholas Winton, and in 2015, he died at the age of 106. I want to tell you about one other brilliant man, in my opinion, Frank Foley. So Frank Foley was a British diplomat in Berlin, responsible for the passport topic. And he also, in fact, was an MI6 agent doing covert missions for providing intelligence to London. And when Hitler and the Nazis raised the power, he became concerned with Jews in Germany, and he wanted to find a way to get them out. He started issuing false visas. This is a man without diplomatic immunity, and so really was taking risks. And when Crystal Nuss occurred, he went around the streets recording things and passed that back to London, but he also hid Jewish people in his home. And he invited journalists to come and meet these Jewish people to hear firsthand about their experiences. And when Jewish people were queuing outside the embassy, and the, the Gestapo came along, he told the Gestapo to go away. Incredible. He apparently had an unflappable nature. But his efforts went even further, because at the outbreak of the war, you'd imagine he'd leave Germany. But he stayed there, going as far as going into some of the camps and forcibly taking Jews out with their false passports. It's remarkable. But this again, he came back to the UK eventually. He settled in Stourbridge in the West Midlands, and he led a very ordinary life. And his efforts really came to light many years later. He was recognised for them after he died. He was made a righteous among the nations by the leading Holocaust Museum in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. And he was made a British hero of the Holocaust by the British government, as was for Nicholas Winton. Frank Foley saved 10,000 lives. 10,000 lives, he and his team, as a result. They decided to. Nobody asked them and nobody forced them. So why am I telling these stories? And why is it instinctive to feel some sort of hope when you hear these stories? The fact is, the story of the Holocaust is a dark one. It's a dark chapter in our history. It's one of destruction and loss. You're talking about gas chambers and mass graves. You're talking about people who were complicit in the murder. Some thought of their personal gain or stood by. The stories that I'm telling you are the minority. And so I suppose my question to leave you with are, why do we hang on to these stories? Why do we think that it's important to remember these positive stories? Is it because we think we would have done the same? Is it because Actually, it's important to know that it wasn't all bad, actually. Is it because we want to have some sense of hope for the future that there is some essence of humanity? I wonder whether we need to believe that if it isn't impossible, there must be a way of doing it. <laughs>